is that liner we put in. Remember, the tip was broken off of it before we started. Did you get an idea how tight it was? And you left it a little proud and sand. I left it a little proud, hit it with a block plane and sand. Oh, let's talk about sanding just a minute. I guess y'all all use power sanders, don't you? If you watch TV, you ever watch the horn use a power sander? No, that is a power sander. <laughs> it runs off a motor. You don't need to do this. I read a, a thesis that a guy at the University of North Carolina wrote for his master's in wood technology on sanding. And here's what he said. The first thing he said was, most important, buy high quality sandpaper. Yeah. So you need the highest quality sandpaper you can get. So don't buy cheap sandpaper. He said the next thing is, if you're using a power sander, he said never advance the sander more than one inch per second. It's about like that. Hmm. You don't need to press down on it. No, the weight of your hand is enough. And he said, you see people doing this all the time? You don't need to do that. He said, just let it sit on there with it with your hand no more than one inch a second. And I've tried to do that's hard. Let me tell you, that's hard to do. You, you, you want to do this. <laughs> I did this on that just a minute ago. But it will leave swirl marks if you do that. If you if you just lightly lay it down there and move it slowly, mm -hmm. using good sandpaper, it's all you gotta do. And he's mentioned that if you did that, your sandpaper lasted longer. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's something I have learned and, and it has, has helped me. When, when I build a piece, uh, I have a, I, I haven't told you about the tools I have. In my shop, I have a, an, eight, an old 18 inch pyromatic plane, big cast iron job uh, with a Celix cutter head in it. Probably the best investment I ever made was buying that Celix cutter head, that spiral cutter head. You can run wood through it sideways and it won't tear it up. Curly wood, you don't need to pay any attention to the grain, just stick it in there. The other good thing about it too is it's got all those little cutters. The chips that come off are about as big as your fingernail. Does not stop up your dust collection system. If you've got straight blade knives, you got those long curls that come off, they stop up your ventilation, your dust collection system in a minute. That one does not because it makes little bitty, little bitty chips. So your barrel, I've got one of those dust gorillas, Oneida systems, and a 55 gallon drum. I know I can get twice as many shavings in it now that I could when I had a straight blade knife. It, it just compacts so much better. Have that, have an eight inch uh, Delta joiner, long bed Delta joiner, one of those that were made in Brazil back several years ago, eight inch long bed, and it has a spiral. I put a Celix head in it. I have a 16 inch Minimax bandsaw. I've got a Delta Unisaw. Got a big Pyromatic 4100 drill press. Got a little Delta 150 drill press from 1948. And I used a little Delta drill press twice as much as I used to do. Uh, Got a uh, jet, os uh, not a jet, I can't remember the name of it, it's an oscillating spindle sander, big cast iron top with nine spindles. Uh, got that. Got a uh, Hegner scroll saw. Got a Delta 14 inch wood metal band saw. Got a Pyromatic floor mounted foot operated mortising machine. Mm. Love that thing. They don't make them anymore. And, uh, Got the bed will move left, right, up, down, tilt, it'll do everything. And the head comes down with foot pressure. You don't have to put your hand up, just step on it, it comes down. It's an industrial. <coughs> I got it from the stool and it has a single phase motor. That's the only one I've ever seen with a single phase motor. Set of chisels for it. The, those, those big foot operated ones use a different chisel than the manually operated ones. The manually operated ones. The chisels are about this long. Mm -hmm. On the industrial ones, they're about that long because they got to go all the way up into that head. And you can, if you've got a, a, a metal lathe, you can extend it. I get your piece of drill rod and uh, drill it and tap in uh, one end of the uh, existing uh, a drill for the mortiser, run your little piece in there and silver solder it in. You can make it, make it make you want to. That's what I've done. Let's see, what else have I got? Oh, I have a uh, uh, Delta, an old 
55 or 56 uh, Delta wood lathe, 42-inch wood lathe. Got it from a guy who had only used it a few times when I bought it. It looked brand new when I got it, and he had every attachment that Delta sold at the time. All the, all of the tool rests, steady rests, all the collar, he had everything with it. And I, I bought it back a few years ago like that. I've got a, another wood bed, uh, metal, uh, wood bed, uh, wood lane that will turn eight feet, six inches between centers. Mm. It's got a big cast iron head, runs off two inch flat belt, drive, uh, turns 16 inches. I don't use it for anything except bed posts. Uh, let's see. Oh, the all nighter dust collection system. Got a Bosch chop saw built into a long table. Uh, oh, I've got a little one by 42 inch belt sander. Those little small, this is a Taiwan made. I use that thing all the time. They're very handy. Use it. I know I'm leaving something out, but I can't remember what, what it is. Oh, yeah. Better put that back on. Sorry. Yeah. Right now. I'm right. I got it. It's on. Okay, we're home now. Good. Lots of hand tools, lots of planes. You know, when I first started woodworking, I thought you had to have lots of planes. I used three. Three planes. I used this one. Little Lee Nelson plane. I got a number four Stanley that I rebuilt with a... It's the name of the guy that teaches all the woodworking classes and sells these thick blades that go in them. Uh, shoot. My Paul said. Cosman. Cosman, yeah. It's a Cosman. I got a Cosman blade and iron in it. Works great. I've got a old uh, Stanley number six, uh, six hundred one bedrock. I use it, but I also got I've got all the Stanley planes from a number two through a number through a number through a number eight. Got them all, but I never use them. I need to sell them. Got a bunch of transitional planes, you know, wood wood bases with metal pieces on it. I probably need to get rid of them. I don't use them. So over the years, after you've used all this stuff, thought you needed all these things, come to find out you really didn't. So you got all this, I got all this stuff, and I'm, I'm looking now to start getting rid of stuff that I, I know I won't use anymore. I'll come haul it away. I'm sorry? <laughs> I'll come haul it away. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna do with, with all of it. But uh, after you find, there were things I started out making that I don't make anymore, and I don't plan to make anymore. So the stuff I used to make with, I don't need anymore. Uh, anyway, uh, we talked about how to, how, to, how to use the sanders. Sanders have been the best thing. I, I had a, for years, I had a, a Porter Cable 505. That's those big half sheet sanders. I thought they were the most wonderful things in the world. And then came out with the, uh, came out with the uh, ones, these Festos, which are just way beyond better than that thing was. So I got a 505 sander I need to get rid of. Got six belt sanders that I've picked up over the years. Uh, you know the ones you should like steam locomotives, three by 21? Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got, got one of those. In fact, i got two of those. And I've got a four by 24 quarter cable, which is what I use now. I do not have the planing gene. A lot of guys I know in the Atlanta uh, South of the group, they can take a piece of wood and plane it, and it comes out looking like a piece of glass. And I can't do that. Uh, you know Jay Stallman, the doctor that's down there in the Atlanta group? No. But Jay, Jay is really good. And uh, he had a piece of curly maple. And he came in one day. We were working on something there. And he came in. He was playing. These, these feathery shavings were coming out. And it looked like glass. I said, how did you do that? And he was using a number four standard. And he had a, a, an aftermarket uh, hawk blade in it. And he said, oh, it's easy. Here, you try it tore the grain out. <laughs> I, could, I could not do it. I was doing exactly what he did. He'd push it, he's feathery grain. I'd push it, tear it. I did not have the planing gene, but I do have the four by 24 belt sander gene. I can use it. <laughs> so when you when you run anything through a plane, if you run it through a straight blade plane, take the board and hold it up with raking light so you can see across it. You'll see little waves, little waves. Because every time that knife 
hits the mower, it presses the wood down, and it cuts and it makes a little wave. Mm -hmm. If you've got a shelix head, you don't get that. You've got lines, straight lines that run parallel with the wood, little faint lines that you can see. You gotta get those out. Just if you take the board out of a planer, either of the straight blade or the other, it looks good. I can use this. I'll sand it like that. No. When you get the finish on it, you're gonna see every one of those ripples. You've got to get those two marks out of there. The guys that are really good with planes, take them out with a plane. I take them out with a four by twenty-four belt sander with a hundred grit belt on it, and I use a piece of graphite <coughs> uh, backed paper. It fits on the platen under your uh, sander. You know where your sander is a platen down there where the belt runs in under. That's metal normally. You just stick a piece of graphite paper on there. Cuts the friction down to almost nothing. And, and it makes a real difference how, how it operates. So I use a four by 24 belt sander. I've had it on the table like this. And I, like I'm landing an airplane. Start it up. Like that. And, and do, see what I did? That's the way you, you don't want to do this. Your whole body needs to move like that. So I, I've gotten good at that over the years. So I take the sandy marks out with the four by 24 belt sander. So I can hold it up to a raking light. And I can see these scratches all going in the same direction. Then, I take my six inch Bosch, I'm a six inch uh, uh, fist tool sander with a 100 grit disc in it. I use a 100 grit belt, use a 100 grit disc. Go up like we were talking about, go over the whole surface carefully, hold it up to the light. Now I can't see those straight lines anymore, they're gone. But there are little swirls in there. You can't hardly really see them, but they're there. So then I use 120, put 120 pad on it, or 120 uh, sandpaper on it. Carefully go over it again. Dust it off. It's important to dust it off. Dust it off. Looks looking better. Then I use 180. And that's as far as I go. I know people that go to 600. Why? I do not know. But they do. I go to, I go to 180. And I have found over the years that that gives me a good look. If you go much, if you start getting up really high in, in, in sanding belt grits, you burnish the wood, and your finish, instead of penetrating, just lays on there. And I, I did an experiment several years ago where I took a piece of cherry, sanded it 100, 120, 180, 220, 240, and used, a, I, I don't use, uh, I don't use stains, but I do use dyes, uh, use uh, transtent dyes, and, and dyed every one of them. With the same, same board, same dye, it looked different. Every one of them looked different. And the reason it did is because it soaked in the grain different. Because you had scratches here, a little less here, a little less here, a little less here. So it was darker here and it got lighter and lighter and lighter. So that told me that the grit you sand to makes a difference in what the finish is going to look like. And, I, and I'm satisfied that 180 is about where I need to be. Sometimes I'll do 120, but usually 180. Now I've gone through the 180 with the machine. The last thing I do is get a sanding block don't use your hand. Use a sanding block and uh, with, with 180 on it, and go over it with the grain. Very lightly. You don't have to bear it down. Just like that. Just a few passes. And that will straighten out any swirls that might have been in the wood. Just a little bit. That's all you got to do. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I use a 4 by bell sander a lot. In fact, I, I mean, on my on my second 40, uh, four by twenty four belt sander because the cords on them are short, and I have caught my foot on them and dropped them off the workbench, mm -hmm. break the handles off of them, epoxy them back, knock them off again, and break them. I've I, I, I broken one so far; I couldn't repair and had to buy a new one. They don't make them anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do now if it ever breaks. Uh, so anyway, that's the, that's the tools I've got. Uh, I buy my sandpaper. Right now, I have been buying it from Cleansport, but uh, I know the people at the Woodcraft there in Chattanooga, the Woodcraft store, and one of the managers gave me a sample pack of Festo sandpaper. And I said, well, this is going to be more than, more than the, uh, the other stuff I've been buying from Cleansport. And he said, no, actually, it's cheaper. 
When I said that's the only thing Festool makes that's cheap, <laughs> and, and and I've been using it, and I like it real well too. So I might try using it next time. And I buy in hundred piece slots. It's cheaper that way. So I've got a box of one twenty, a box of hundred, a box of one twenty, a box of one eighty, and a box of, of two twenty. Um, I have a, I'll mention, didn't mention this before, I have a 6 by 48 uh, bell sander with 12 inch disc on the Pyromatic. Probably the least used tool I've got. Hardly ever use it. And I, don't, I cannot remember the last time I used a disc on the side. I've used a bell sander a few times, but I, I don't use it much. Oh, I have a, uh, a little, a little 12 inch pointer, a little 12 inch, uh, what they call lunchbox pointers. A friend of mine in Nashville called me one day. His next door, one of the, this is the same guy that had the next door neighbor that worked for uh, worked for Gibson. His other next door neighbor had a company that that uh, retrieved wrecked tra tractor trailer rigs all over the country. They go bound and you know you'd sell whatever was on. He called me and said, "Are you interested in any Wilton? Wilton was the name of the brand. Any Wilton tools?" And I said, "Well, what has he got?" And he said, "Well, he's got a drill press and he's got these." these 12-inch uh, planers, and he's got about 60 of them. They were in this tractor-trailer truck that ran off of a hill and tumbled two or three times. And he said, most of them are beat up pretty bad, but I think I can find some that'll, that are usable. And so he said, how much do you want for them? He said, $50 a piece. So we went up there and bought three of them. He bought one, I bought one, and we bought another for parts. $150 about three planers. And that's a handheld planer? No, it sets, you know, it's a little, like a little wall uh -huh. I use it for thin stuff. Uh, you don't want to run eight inch stuff through a 24 inch pyromatic plane. Mm -hmm. you, know, you just don't want to do that. But that little one, oh, that's fine. So I have it off in another room. I have something that I've got a bell saw uh, uh, molder plane. Remember those? They used to sell. That was, I had those, that was my first plane. And it had knives with it that you could do molding with. And I bought a Bought a bunch of, bought a shop out, got a bunch of molding cutters, and for years I built mantles for two builders there in town. In fact, that's how I made my money to buy my tools, was I was building mantles. After I retired, uh, I built probably 100, 150 mantles for uh, this guy. He was building houses, he had two mantles in every house, and I built all his mantles. You could buy, back 15 years ago, you could buy the material to build a mantle. I was making my own molding using that plane, that uh, molding plane, and I, uh, you could buy all the materials to make a mound, including caulking and priming, for $175 and sell it for five. And so I was doing two of those, three or four of those a month. So that was that was good income, which allowed me to buy stuff. I don't, I'm, I'm making one next week. It'll be the first one I've made in years. I can't remember the last one I made, but I'm making one for him next week to remodel in the house and then on another mound. So got to make one to match what he's, he's already got. My lumber, I get. I've been getting lumber for 50, you know, 40 years from my friend Jim Carden over in, he was from Huntsville, Alabama. He's an engineer for NASA. He grew up uh, in a town, a uh, little town uh, north of Menville, Tennessee, and his next door neighbor ran a sawmill. So he knew all about sawmill. And his, his hobby was buying walnut, cherry, poplar logs, sawing them up, taking the wood and selling them to woodworkers. He and I became friends, and I get all my wood from him until he passed away. And now his uh, son-in-law has it all, and I get it from them. This wood, I don't work any wood that's not at least 10 years old. Most of it's 30 years old. It's all air-dried. Been air stacked outside and air-dried for 10 or 12 years, then bought into the barn, and I kept in the barn, and I got all I need. I, don't, I do not like kill-dried lumber. I like air-dried, especially walnut. If you, air, if you kill dry walnut, you have ruined it. The colors just don't look good. So I use an air dried walnut. And thank goodness I've got a good supply. So when I get ready to build anything, I've got a lot at the house, but if I don't have enough, I'll go over to the farm and we'll go through one of the barns. There's three barns on the property. A hay barn, two hay barns and a tobacco barn. Stack 20 foot high with lumber. Just, oh, I mean, everything you can. Where is it? <laughs> it's in Mulberry, Tennessee, six miles from Jack Daniels Distillery in Lynchburg, right there on, there on the Crystal Ridge Road. And the problem we've had, though, 
It's powder post beads. You don't know much about powder post beads in this part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Any light colored wood, they will eat it up. We had poplar boards in there, this wide. Take them out, it's like in the shop with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. Can't use them. Just sick. But I don't know what we could have done to prevent it. Maple, in this part of the country, you cannot air dry maple. Maple will be eaten up this afternoon if you stack it outside. Powder post beads would like it better than anything. So I don't have a lot of maple. The maple I do have, I bought from a peach tree lumber in uh, Atlanta, and they had a bunch of curly maple several years ago that they were trying to get rid of. And I bought a bunch of curly maple from them. Most of what I use is cherry, first, walnut, second. Now let's look at the pictures right here. talked about this already, that's the little table saw. Uh, that base is a design that I saw several years ago. Go back to the first one. Uh, I've got also got my, my little drill press on a table like this. See that door in the bottom there? See that little thing below it with a slot below it? That's a lever. The inside, inside there, there's a folding floor that's got casters on it. When it's in the position you see there, the casters are up and the table is sitting on the floor push the lever down and slide it over in one of those slots is now up on the caster and roll it around. It's a good design. Okay, we talked about all this. Okay, that right there is a sugar chest. We talked about sugar chest earlier. That's what, in Kentucky, they went crazy, the sugar chest. Tennessee are always, like you saw before, in box. In Kentucky, they made everything sugar chest. This is a, looks like a little desk. It's actually a sugar chest. It's divided on the inside, and it uh, would have been uh, used to hold sugar. That lid doesn't come forward like you'd think on a drop leaf desk. It goes up, and uh, it has a little drop. Let's go to the next slide. It shows it. No, it doesn't. Go back. Anyway, the, the front of it, uh, this, is, this thing was made in Kentucky, and it is the pride of the uh, Kentucky State Museum, the uh, Speed Museum. It's in the Speed Museum. And it is really nice. You see those little feet on it? Those little bandy feet? Those are called Tuttle feet. Collectors of Kentucky furniture like Tuttle feet. The reason they call them Tuttle feet is there was a piece of furniture in Kentucky that had the name Tuttle on the inside of it in the drawer. It had these feet on it. Therefore, they all called Tuttle furniture. Term of Tuttle feet. Well, Mr. Tuttle couldn't have lived long enough to make all the furniture in Kentucky that has those feet on it. Everybody copied everybody else. This was the style in Kentucky in the 1830s. And you see chest of drawers, you see desks, you see all kinds of things with these little Tuttle feet on it. This one is so unique, not only because of its shape, but also because of the way the front is made. Those are burl cherry panels. Little burl cherry, that's not, that front is veneer, all veneer. And uh, it's got burl cherry outlined with banding, and then uh, another banding in between, a wider banding in between. Uh, I found uh, certainly wood is a veneer supplier. They had a bundle of cherry burl veneer, and it and it was selling, and it was like I don't know a dollar and a quarter a board foot. But if you bought all he had, which was a pretty good stack, it was twenty five cents a board foot, yeah. a square foot, twenty five cents a square foot. And I said, I'll take it all. So I, I think it was like $65. What got stuck out there? That's not very long. You know, those, those pearls are only about this long. But I've got a, a lot out of it. So that's, that's, that's what I liked about it was that unique front. I'm going to go to the next one. Down below, it had a star. Um, maple and uh, ebony uh, star. And then banding, a little banding above that. And uh, we'll talk about how you do that bend, banding uh, later. Okay, let's go to the next one. We've talked about this already. Andrew Jackson Sugar Chest. That one right now is at a show in Clarksville, Tennessee in an uh, art gallery. Be there in October. All right, this, this is a Tennessee folk art chest, a copy of that. Uh, if you're a, the folk, we talk about antiques going down in price. Folk art has not. Folk art has held its own. And this is considered folk art. It's about this big. 
It's a child's miniature chest. It's got a house on the front of it. And it's at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, the original is, over in Winston-Salem. And uh, I just thought it was neat and I made one. And you can see the inlay there on the front, that little house. Somewhere here I have the pieces of that. I made a big block and just sawed it up. Where did I put that? I'll do this one. I was going to make several of those. So, glued up this block. That's the house. This is the chimney. This is the roof. Slice those off and in line. How thick do you slice those? I'm sorry? How thick do you slice them? Oh, about 16. 16. I used a bandsaw with a, with a, uh, uh, sharp blade on it and just saw them off. So that's enough for about probably five or six. I can make five or six more of those. A friend of mine got in the business of, make, of making these and people would bring a picture of their house to me and he would make an inlay of their house and put their house on the front. Oh, yeah, Tom Cowan, he made a bunch of them. Uh, let's see, there it is. That's a, that, that inlay is about a sixteenth of an inch thick. Those are holly inlays below there, diamonds and circles. Okay. Now here's a, a guy, I had that, that piece in the show and I sold it to a lady in Knoxville and the guy at the show came by and wanted me to make him one in a nautical theme, he said. And I said, what do you want on it? And he said, I want a whale and I want a harpoon and anchors and stuff like that. So I made the same pattern, I just made, made, made it like this and put hearts on it. You can see it's got an anchor. It's got a harpoon, it's got a whale. Go to the next one. And there's the, I just found a drawing somewhere of a whale and just made an outline out of it, cut it out of holly and inlaid it. And that's the compass rose on the top. Okay, this is a Sheridan style uh, chest of drawers. I'm working on one of these right now for my daughter, my granddaughter. Uh, it's got French feet on it and it's got this, it's, I like this style. This is federal. Really simple, nice looking chest of drawers. That is a Carlisle Lynch pattern. Uh, Carlisle Lynch has a lot of furniture patterns. You may have seen some Americas. He was, he was from Virginia and uh, made, made really good measured drawings of antique furniture. This is a fan inlay. It's the first fan inlay I ever made. And uh, it goes on there. And I, I didn't make it out of the mirror. I made it out of maple, probably an eighth of an inch thick. That's the very first one I ever did. Uh, this is a Sheraton sideboard. Uh, I told you about my friends I get the wood from. His daughter, Karen, uh, she's the CEO of a, of a big uh, credit union in Middle Tennessee, has a beautiful home, and has asked me to make furniture for her for years. And I probably made the best stuff I've ever made she has. And this is, I made this for her. This is a Sheraton style break front. I made those two knife boxes up on the top there. Go to the next one. Uh, there's some of the inlay with bell flowers. I cut all the veneer for this. This is walnut and walnut veneer. I cut all the book mesh with veneer on it. And it has holly. Now there's a difference. So that's another sugar chips. I mean, a spice box. It's taller, you can tell. Taller than this one. And it's got a different design on the front. I saw that design when I did a Google search of, uh, I did a Google search on Pennsylvania spice boxes, images. You get thousands of images. Went down through there, and this one was sold by an antique dealer. Had a full, had a picture of it, and I made, and I made a, uh, uh, made a copy of it. I like, I like that inlay. I made that for my sister-in-law on her, her, either her, th yeah, her third husband when she got married to it. <laughs> <laughs> had to count them. Yeah, her third. Husband. So I made it for her. And what she did was these are these were typically given as gifts for weddings. And you would put the initials of the uh, bride and groom on the inside of the day of their wedding. So they were married back in 2012. Her name is Glenna, his name is Mark, and her last name is Herrenbeck. So G M H. So he's got a different, completely different style of boxes, um, drawers on the inside. And this is, a, I made a bunch of these. These are uh, little single tea caddies. And uh, you can use them to store anything, they're not very big. 
they're easy to make. I've taught classes in those several times. Mark Adams and Atlanta and Knoxville, several places. But it incorporates a lot of the stuff that's in these boxes, this uh, double 45 degree miter around the outside. Uh, the boxes are made out of solid wood and are spline miter. On the, all four corners are spline miter. Using that quarter inch blade, that, that little seven and a quarter inch blade, 16 inch curve, mm -hmm. set up everything, put a 16 inch spline in there, because it fits 16 inch plywood, fit right in there. Put a, put a clamp on it, and you've got a nice little box. Then you put all the veneer and inlay on it, and you saw the top off. It's a How did you do the, the code? Did you make a code piece for the piece? Yes, you make that, you make that separately. Uh, actually, the only thing that's coved on there is the foot itself. Okay. The uh, flat from here on, it's uh -huh. just, just coved right there. Uh -huh. And you cut those out on the bandsaw. <laughs> That's not hard to do. You make, what you do is when you're making this, you make the bottom part of it first. This, you make this frame first. And it screws to the box from the bottom. It's a whole lot easier to make it first and cut the box to fit it rather than make the box and try to cut that bottom part to fit it. So you make the bottom first, take those dimensions, and make sure you get them so the box sits right on there. And if you make a little mistake, it's covered up by the band. Goes around it. So are those feet separate than the, from the apron? Uh, yes. Yeah, they're separate. They're, you have that thing would have been made in two pieces. You had the box, and then you had the little the feet frame screwed at the bottom of the box. But the frame itself is it four feet plus the four apron? Yeah, yeah, it's four pieces. And there's a those are mortised and tenon together. So a little mortise, a mortise cut in these feet and a tenon cut on these pieces, and they want some tenon in there. And you do all that, uh, you do all that uh, before, you, you cut those mortises when you cut the feet out. You start out with a blank and you run, you run the two mortises on opposite 90 degree corners, and then you bandsaw out the little feet, so when you get through the little feet, they've got a little mortise already cut them. And then the other side is just tenon into it. And that's a shell inlay on the top. We'll talk about this more tomorrow, but uh, I make those. That's made out of, that's holly with a green dye in the background, a veneer on it. It's all made out of veneer. And uh, go back one more. And we'll talk about how to do this. We're, we're going to do some sand shading, but we're also going to do some of that. That little shell line, that's a little different technique. Okay. Uh, this is another box I made. Uh, when I had to show some stuff in Knoxville, a guy came by and wanted a box to show. He had a collection of Philippe Petit watches, really nice watches, and he wanted a box to put them in. And he liked the design of the shell, so he wanted, he wanted that a curly maple. That curly maple, really curly, is from a drawer front of an antique piece of furniture. Hmm. I helped with a sale, a, a, a realtor had a sale in town, and uh, they had a whole bunch, this, this guy was a cabinet maker. And he had a whole bunch of antiques. When I got up there, they were getting ready to put them on fire and burn them because they were, they were just pieces, you know, drawer fronts, sides. Really good wood. Mahogany, curry maple. And they're going to burn them. And I said, can I have that? <laughs> he said, yeah. So I got a bunch of this old, really old curry maple. I bet you that piece of wood was, it's easy 200 years old, maybe older than that. And I made the box out of it, put the shell on it. Okay. Uh, that's the shell. It looks a little different than the other one. Uh, this is a uh, document box. Uh, I make these for my friends that have been in the military, and these are not these are not difficult to make either. This is a this is a dovetail box. This box is dovetail. The little feet are separate and they screw on. The top is the outstanding part where you've got banding going all the way around it. Corner fans like this in the corners and then the eagle inlay in the middle. We're gonna talk about the eagle inlay tomorrow. I got one. I'll show you how to put it together. I cut it out yesterday. That's a nice, that makes a nice looking box. Really nice. You can use that to set on the sideboard, hold letters in, put it on a dresser, hold jewelry, do, do anything with it. Just makes a nice box. About this big. And that's another one I made with my American flag inlays. 
and uh, made a I made a corner fan out of red, white, and blue. I gave that I think my cousin has that box. Uh, this is another one. Uh, uh, this is a letter box. It's a uh, pro maple, and I wanted to show you this because you see it's got initials inlaid in the top. See those initials? You can go online and get uh, all kind of uh, different fonts. Run through, print them, run through Xerox machines, shrink them wherever you want to using this pattern. You use uh, poly veneer, but when you cut them out, you need to glue the holly veneer up. You need to glue a piece of holly veneer with a grain one this way and a piece of holly veneer with a grain one this way. Glue them together so that you've got a piece of basically thin plywood. If you don't do that, they'll crack and break. You've got to have two pieces glued together opposite. So you glue two pieces of holly veneer together, cut those letters out, they're very stable, then you can uh, inline. That's got a, a piece of that uh, Gibson guitar ebony uh, keyhole out there. Okay, next one. Ah. The Patent Secretary. This is in the Tennessee State Museum in Nashville. Uh, I have a friend that was a curator for years of furniture up there. And I was ready to make a, a, a secretary. And I was talking to him. He said, oh, you need to come. You keep, need to come copy the Patent Secretary at the museum and make that one. It, he said, I really like it. And I went up and looked at it. I liked it too. So they were, they're closed on Mondays. And I went up and spent all day Monday with him taking photographs, measuring, getting everything right to make an exact copy of that. And I have that piece in my living room right now. We were talking about mistakes earlier. This is a veneer piece. It's probably made around 1830. Uh, can you see up here the light and the dark? That's sapwood, cherry sapwood. Mm -hmm. Normally, you won't want sapwood. This guy incorporated the sapwood into the design so that the sapwood on either side of the panel looks a little like grapes. This, is a, this picture was taken just a few weeks, a few days after I finished the piece, so it hadn't darkened down yet. Today, that contrast between the sapwood and the cherry is way, way more noticeable. Much, the cherry's much darker. Now, the drawer fronts, he made this the veneer he used up here, he also used on the drawer fronts. And he put the sapwood on the top of each drawer. There's another drawer in here you can't see. Except this one. On this one, the light wood is on the bottom. And I said, what happened? Well, I don't know what happened. He was laying all the drawers out and he got them turned around. <laughs> and by then, they had already dovetailed it together. And he said, I can't do anything about this. I just stuck it in there. So that was a mistake he made. Another thing that I found on it was... I think work has been done on this uh, over the years. You notice the keyhole liner on here, here, and here. There's also one on the drop wave. If, I, if, I, if you were making it, they would all be the same. You know, you make them all the same. They're all different on the original. The bottom ones are not like the ones on the top, and the ones on the top are not like the ones on the drawer, and the ones on the drop wave are not the same. I am confident that they replaced the drop lid. That drop lid has been replaced. Uh, let's see if there's another. Is there another picture of that on there? No, I'm scrolling up maybe. No, it's not on there. Uh, that drop lid, you opened it up, has stringy all the way around out of the perimeter and quarter fans on each corner. Well, that's a breadboarded top. Like, like this. Got a breadboard in. It's got mortise and tenons in here holding it together. And on the original, on the one that's in Nashville right now, the stringings out here, and the quarter fan lays right across that joint. Well, that joint moves. It's, of course, they were destroyed. No good cabinet maker would have done that. So I think that lid had been replaced. And reason, another reason I think it had been replaced too was because on the desk side where the hinges were mounted. They had several different places where hinges had been replaced. On the lid, there was only one. So that was sure that lid had been replaced. Does it not look like that, those two drawers at the top, one of them is upside down? One of them's upside down. If you look at the, at the sapwood, lighter at the bottom on the left, lighter at the top on the right. Yeah, they're both supposed to be, they're, they're alike on both sides, supposedly. But the width of the sap? Oh, the width of the sap's probably different, yeah. 
I if, if, all that. if the right one were turned upside down. Oh, it might match better? They would match. Yeah. And, the, and the curly part would yeah. go in the same direction. When, it, uh, when you look at it today, darker, I don't, you don't notice it as much. Mm. But I think that lid had been, the drop lid had been replaced. And at some point in time, they may have reworked. This, this thing's got all kinds of secret drawers in it. The center section pulls out. There's a section behind it. The polyester's pull out. Little drawers have different stuff. There's all kinds of secret drawers in it. It's got uh, French feet, you know, feet curve out at the bottom. The guy that built this, this thing's built in Knoxville about 1830. A cabinet maker had to have come from the east. It was a very well made piece of uh, furniture. And if you notice the star, let's go over a couple more. Keep going. Yeah, see the star? That's a 12 point Moravian star. The Moravians were over around Winston Salem, a religious city, and they used a 12 inch, a 12 point star. So we think, the people who curate furniture, think that that cabinet maker had, some, had spent some time in the Winston Salem area where he picked up that design and later incorporated it into this piece. It's a cherry, got quarter fans up in the corner. You can barely see the quarter fans, but they're there. Uh, that's a burled walnut oval with a five or 12 point star in the middle of it. Uh, go back. On the sides of the, of the lower and upper section, this is what's called vine and leaf inlay. Very common to Germans. Germans use this a lot. It's got a stylized flower pot at the bottom vine with leaves on it and a flower at the top. Very stylized look. Uh, I inlaid all that and that sinuous curve, I took a piece of half inch MDF and just laid out a sinuous curve, double side taped it to the, to the furniture, took the Dremel tool with the little, just guided it down. Started at the flower pot and ended at the flower, cut it in there, laid in the uh, Vine, and then came back with chisels or gouges. One, one chop this way, another chop that way to make the leaves. Stick the leaves in there. Didn't take just a few minutes to make it. How they did it originally, they used to have a thing called a uh, shoulder chisel, which we don't see nowadays, but if you look at old uh, manuscripts and stuff, the Germans especially used shoulder chisels. It was a long chisel that fit on your shoulder and you pushed it like a guide, guiding it and it had different size cutters in it. And the curators think that that's how that was cut. That this guy had this shoulder chisel and he just walked it down through there and made that channel for the vine. So do yours, yours match each side? I yeah, I used, the same, same I used the same pattern. Yeah. So if they used the shoulder chisel, they, they wouldn't have come close to matching. No. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I think that's about it. There's, there's the star. Mm. Uh, University of Tennessee in zone mm. jewelry box. Mm. I showed some furniture in Knoxville three years ago right before they replaced the football coach. And uh, I said, this will sell. Oh, yeah. in, in downtown Knoxville, the East Tennessee Woodworkers Guild has a, they have, there's a gallery down, downtown. Every two years they have a big show there. It draws four or 5,000 people. And I said, hey, this thing to sell. So I put a price on it. Click on over there. It looks like the East Tennessee. It looks like Tennessee's end zone. Not a taker. Nobody <laughs> even questioned about it. And I think it was because they, they were, things were bad in Knoxville football to get rid of the coach. And, you know, nobody wanted it. So I gave it to my best friend for his 50th wedding anniversary. He went to UT. He loves it. <laughs> Made these last Christmas for Christmas presents. They're octagonal tea boxes, tea, tea chests. You can make those with uh, a little uh, set of cutters that comes, uh, they make dovetail, they make a drill, round bit cutters that will cut angles, you know, like for flower pots and stuff. And you can buy a cutter that will make an octagonal cut. And once you get it set up, you get your router table set up, just run those things through there, Cut the sides, they fit together again with a spline miter or a clamp on them. You can make them in no time. And some of these are solid wood, some of them are veneer. And on the veneer, when I would veneer all the wood first for a cutting, usually you have a vacuum press, 
I take a big board, stick it in the vacuum press, put some veneer on it. Then I got a popular board with mahogany on it, and I can cut that up. And I made all the little inlays on there for that. Uh, one of those is lace wood. One of them's lace wood, and the other one's faulted maple, plain maple, mahogany, mahogany, and cherry. Uh, more TK. I made those year before last year. How do, get on, how do we get on your Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> I don't make as much as I used to. Back when all my aunts and uncles were alive, I made made seventeen things every Christmas. Seventeen things every Christmas. I'm now down to about mm -hmm. six. I think about six. This is the uh, just the drawers I made for my daughter. Uh, made two of these at the same time. I'd go either side of her bed. I made her bed. Uh, she wanted a king size bed, so I found it picture of a New England cannonball bed, upsized it to a king size. Well, I don't know if y'all have made your bed recently, but if you go buy mattresses nowadays, mattresses are not like this anymore. They're like this. Great, huge mattresses. By the time you make the bed, the mattress is so high, you can't see the headboard. You, you put the mattress on, put pillows up there, you know it's a headboard. So you got to redesign the bed so that you raise the headboard up, make it bigger, so that when you get the mattress and everything on there, there's still headboard or viewable. When we do that, the mattress is about right here. My, my son in law six 6'8". My daughter's 5'11". They don't have any trouble getting in a bed that high. My grandkids do, so I had to build a three-step thing for them. When the thunder comes, they have to be able to get their mom and daddy. So I had to build, had to build them a step ladder to get in there. But if you have a bed that high, normal bedside tables are like this. You know about that high. If you're in bed, you got to being down to get to your bedside table. Well, I put a chest of drawers there. Now, the mattress is here, the top of the chest of drawers go right there. You just reach right over there. And that's Curly Cherry. Looks, looks good. That's a design from uh, Jeff Headley. That's a copy of a Winchester, Virginia chest. It's got French feet on it too. We talked about the inlay already. And see that, that little string that goes around the top? Oh, yeah. I did that with a router with a little straight cutter in it, just fall around and cut a little groove. All right, that's not a, that's not a breadboarded top, that's, a, that's just a regular top. So that's the end grain out on the end. So I put the, put the string in on the end grain, and I said, well, that won't last two weeks. You know, expand and contract, it'll be gone. It's been seven or eight years, and it hadn't moved at all, and I do not know why. But I thought it would bust. Uh, go back one more time on that. Yeah, that's got, can you see the cop beating around the doors? See that? The cop beating around the door. That's there to protect the, the wood on the front of the door. Those doors are veneered. I cut all those veneers. There was a, I had a curly board, five quarter curly board, and I had my bandsaw set up on this side, on this side and off. One right after the other, and veneered the front. Uh, all those doors came out the same piece of wood, so if you look at them, the grain's the same. All the way. And uh, to protect that veneer, you, you know, the veneer's sticking out there and it's, it's raw. It's just sticking out. You can kick stuff on it and break it off. So the way they did, the, what they did to prevent that from happening was run a cotton bead around it, which covers that raw edge, so you don't tear the veneer off. So that's what, that's what that is. And, and you see that, that's common on all kinds of furniture. Even if you don't have the near front, you still put a cop bean on it because it just looks good. Just a little shadow line, just looks nice. It's a, a little upgrade. This is a celery, a whiskey case. Uh, they were popular in England, and they came to this country where they were popular in the southern colonies. Uh, they were used originally in, in Europe. They were just cats that held the land of tin, and they had ice in them, and they chilled the land. When they came to this country, they took it on a different form, a rectangular form. It's just a box sitting on a table. And we didn't drink that much wine, but we drank whiskey. So this holds whiskey. And uh, see, did that okay, open another picture maybe? Yeah. You see how it opens up? You can't see it down inside, but inside there there's a grid. Just big enough to hold a whiskey bottle, to hold 12. And when I got ready to build that piece, everything works off the grid. Everything's scaled off the grid. So I went to the liquor store with a square and a ruler. <laughs> I said, where's your bourbon? 
and just kind of stood, looked at me and said, back there. I went back there and I measured now, how tall is the average bourbon bottle? How big is it? Came to find out that the average bur bourbon bottle would fit in four and a half inch square. It's got to be 12 inches tall. So that's what I made the grid, four and a half inches square. And the lid is tall, tall enough to get a 12 inch bottle. So, and then everything else still off of that. Uh, this is a Carlisle Lynch, a modified Carlisle Lynch design. These things were very popular in, 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 uh, in uh, Virginia and in South Carolina and in, in, in the Charleston area. If you were, had a, again, this is federal stuff, 1800, 1810, if you were a wealthy person living in those areas, uh, you would have one of these in your house to store bourbon in. Shelf put with a drawer at the bottom, and you can't see it. The molding pulls out with a shelf in there for mixing. You pull the shelf out there, you mix it, and slide the shelf back in. Uh, I made this one, one on the left, I made for my brother. It's got a Y inlay, you see the inlay Y in the lid, so when you open the lid up, you see it. See the inlay. The other one is for his business partner, his last name is Dennis, so it has a Dennis, so it has a D on it. It has the same. I'm sorry. Where do you get plans? Uh, Carlisle Lynch has plans for it. I have plans for it on the Sapple website. Uh, and so I have, I have uh, the uh, a set of plans for it that are uh, the original size, the size that you made. I I but I've got, I've got some extra copies. Send me some information. I got this card. I bring it in. And anyway, just, I'll, I'll send you a set. I've got several of them. Uh, the unusual thing about that, go back to the first picture. This is a box sitting on a table, basically. But the molding that goes around there, between the table, between the bottom part and the top part, that molding's attached to the top. When you pick up the top, the top's got handles on it, so you can pick it up. The molding comes off as part of the top, not part of the table. Unusual. And it's got, of course, a lot of, a lot of inlay on it. Uh, nothing really fancy. Uh, got bell flowers in the legs and a, a pattern across the bottom. And here's the very pattern that he used for the, the old one. Anyway. Is there anything on the uh, table to contain that molding? Oh, yeah. The top? Look, the, so uh, fits in. the table has a mic, is, has a groove all the way around it. So that when you set the box on it, it locks and sits right in there, keeps it from moving. Yeah, it, it's, it's not sliding around on that. There's the little oval inlay. That is, uh, what do you think that wood is? It looks like satin wood. It's quarter saw sycamore. Oh, really? Quarter saw sycamore looks like lace wood. Huh. I was going to say lace wood. I don't know if you noticed this or not. It's little plexiglass patterns. It has stacks of plexiglass patterns. <laughs> That right there, use the router, feel like we were talking about. Route out the design for the oval. There's another one. It's got all kinds of them. And these are, I'll, tomorrow I'll show you why these are so helpful. It's got uh, brass feet, castered feet on it. Um, I have an article, you can really hear some making of these. Yeah. This is 
this is the first eagle. You go back again. That's the first. That's the first eagle in light I ever made. Made that for my high school, my college roommate who was. We did, I graduated from college in '68. I should have graduated in '66, but I was not a good student. I fooled around. And I didn't graduate. You know, trying to graduate, and we were going to get drafted. Everybody was getting drafted. And, he and I said, what are we going to do to keep from getting drafted? And I said, we need to go sign up for either the Navy or the Air Force as a pilot. Because we were interested in doing it. And so we went down and took the Navy, the Navy flight physical and the test, Air Force flight physical and test, passed both of them. They sent a letter to the draft board saying, don't draft these boys. They're going to go in the Air Force and they're graduate from college. So they kept us in school another year which allowed me to graduate. And uh, when I got ready to leave uh, <coughs> college, I was supposed to report to the Air Force. I graduated in June, supposed to be at the Air Force, Lackland Air Force Base, June the 24th. Well, about the first week in May, they sent me a letter and said, hey, we've overstaffed the class for June, so we're going to put you off to September. My roommate got the same letter, but his said, we expect you there in June. So he got to go, and I didn't. And so he goes off to Lackland Air Force Base, and I didn't have a job. So I called, I interviewed with the Tennessee Valley Authority for a summer job a year before. So I said, well, maybe they got some. So I called their office and said, I'm graduating from college in two weeks. I have a degree in engineering, I'm looking for a job. And they said, would you be willing to work on a construction site? And I said, sure. And they said, we're building this nuclear plant in Athens, Alabama, and we're looking for engineers. And I said, that sounds good to me. And they said, when do you be here? <laughs> I said, be there, you know, the day after I graduate. They said, well, come to this address. So I went up there. They hired me on the spot. I said, oh, yeah, we're ready for you to go to work. And uh, I said, now, you, you understand? I've got one in the Air Force at the end of the summer. That's all right. You know, come on. Well, I was dating this young lady the last several months I was in school. It started to get real serious. He said, you know, maybe I don't need to go to the Air Force. Maybe I need to stay here and get married. So, one day I was sitting there, and she knew I was going in the Air Force. So one day, a personnel guy comes by, and he says, uh, can we fill you out a draft deferment? And I said, for what? And he said, well, we're, we supply energy to uh, all kinds of defense industries, and we have draft deferment. And I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And a couple of days later, he comes back and says, well, you got a deferment. And he got a letter from the, from the draft board saying, yeah, hey, you're down in, a, in an essential job. And I was at Browns Ferry measuring pipe for a nuclear plant. You know, in a big pipe. So I decided to get married and stuff. I called my roommate. I ain't going to be there. <laughs> I ain't going to be there in September. What? He, what? He said, and he didn't talk to me for six months. Finally, he called me one day, and we made up. And, and he absolutely loved the Air Force. He, uh, he was a, he was too big, he was 6'3", he couldn't fly fighter jets, but he flew uh, transport, C-141s and other stuff. And he got, he went to Vietnam twice and uh, flew over there. And then when he got, the Vietnam War was over with, he, he, he was assigned to Charleston, Charleston uh, Air Force Base down there, and he flew the diplomatic group. Now, you want to talk about a cushy job. He flew diplomats all over the world. And you could talk to him about any place in the world, he'd been there two or three times. And he was talking about where the best Italian food is. Well, I'd eat at this place, this place. He knew everything. And, he, and I got to talking to him about the difference between being a, an engineering manager and an Air Force pilot. I had to manage it. I had to fill out service reviews, disciplinary, all that stuff. Nope, not if you're a pilot in the Air Force. You fly the airplane. That's all you do. You don't do any of those things. The first sight takes care of that. So he, he prospers in the Air Force. And he, he, uh, he gets assigned to a squadron commander during Desert Storm. And his squadron does really good. So he's now a full colonel. He retired full colonel. And I asked him about it. I said, well, what, what do you do as a squadron commander? He said, not much. <laughs> and he said, the first day I came to work, he said, uh, it, when I became the colonel, he said, I came in, and I got out of my car. And of course, I had a place for me to park, but I got 
car, walked in, the first car said, Colonel, how's everything going? He said, oh, just fine. He said, I dropped my newspaper when I got out of the car and blew away in the parking lot. He went in and sat down in his office, opened up the curtains, and he said, every airman on the base was in the parking lot picking up the paper. <laughs> and he said, I've got a lot of power. <laughs> But anyway, he was my best friend, and we we piled around forever. And he, he retired, and I retired. We were doing all kinds of things together. I got a call one morning from his wife. He got up, said, "I'm feeling good," and dropped dead. Like that, 60, 70 years old. Terrible. But I made this for him before he died, and this was a Air Force Blue, and he was, he was proud of it. Okay, that's, uh, I, just, I just finished this about a month ago. This is a dwarf tall case clock. It's this clock. Looks just like a full one. It's not about this big. And uh, it's got an antique movement in it. I was lucky enough to find a, um, a movement for a dwarf clock, and, and it fit perfect. Uh, next, yeah, the reason I put it on here was to show you the inlay. It's got an oval, just not, it's a simple, a pearl oval inlay on it. And the door, next one, the door has a uh, vertical grain mahogany, uh, ribbon mahogany border around the door. That's all the inlay it has on it. This again is, is a federal piece. Huh. This piece right here, we were talking about how things look when they were originally made. This is a East Tennessee rope and tassel corner cover. Rope and tassel corner covers can be traced to one family in one little uh, valley in East Tennessee. There's probably 10 or 15 of these in existence in the world today, and that, that family made all of them. They are noted by the rope and tassel at the top. And you see all this inlay they put on? That's not how it looks. That piece is in the East Tennessee Historical Society. You go in and look at it now, and you can't see hardly any of the inlay. Probably it's got the original finish on it. A lady at uh, the University of Tennessee did her master's thesis on this piece. And she went back with photo microscopy and looked at all the inlays to see what they looked like originally. Those things were red and green and just had all kinds of patterns in them, which you could not see because it was covered up by the finish. But when she looked at them, you could see them. So she got with a guy who does Photoshop. They Photoshopped it. They took a picture of the original and then Photoshopped it to put back in what it looked like originally. So this would have how that piece would look when it's brand new. So I, just thought, I just thought that was really neat. These, these inlays here in the corner are green checkerboard. These are red checkerboard. These are green, white, and red. These are red. It just, it's just got all kind of color on them. We think of their furniture as being dull. It was far from dull. If you go to the Peabody Essex Museum, in Boston, uh, they've got a lot of uh, pilgrim centers for furniture. You know, big old heavy stuff, court cupboards and all that. Ugly, black, dark look. And that's not what they looked like when they were new. They were very, very brilliant. Painted with lots of bright colors. Because they were in dark homes, they wanted everything to be light. But for 250 or 300 years of sitting in a building with a fireplace, finish me. They've got an original court cupboard with its old original finish on it, and right next to it, a reproduction of how it would look in the view. That's all together. It's white, it's red, it's black, it's got all kinds of really neat designs on it. And they did the same thing that this lady did. They went back and looked at it to see what it looked like the Why don't they consider restoring those old ones back to the original like they would have painted? Most of those people most of those people in the furniture world don't want to do anything. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to do that with the paintings. They touch I know. It. I know. I can't tell you why, but that, that's that's what they do. They, they and they just tell you all oh, you've done the worst thing in the world because you stripped it. Now you can actually see the inlay. And before, you know, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, some of the inlay uh, work that I've been you know, associated with over the last several years. Let's see. Oh, uh, did you pass around the keyhole? Yeah, there it is. I found my microjet. 
is the one you want to use right here. Use this one and stop it won't come on. Uh, if you get glue stuck in that thing, if I haven't done that out a lot, let it set, if it get cleaned up, you put it in boiling water. Submerge it in boiling water, glue will come right out. Where can you get stuff like that? Oh, you can order it off the internet. I get it off the eBay. Amazon. Yeah, Amazon sells it. They do. Yep. There's a the real value catalog too. But the Microjet 400 is what's important. Do uh, you think we could use a drill press, maybe? Yeah, sure. And a, and a bandsaw, maybe? Sure. Okay, good. Let me show you some. What color is We'll go out here and stand around a drill press. Can we do that? Sure. sure.